senator from Ohio. And Madam President, I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the quorum call. Without objection. And Madam President, I ask unanimous consent to speak as if in morning business for up to 10 minutes. Without objection. Thank you, Madam, Madam President. Um, earlier today, uh, Senator Durbin and the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on the Constitution, Civil Rights, and Human Rights held a hearing in Cleveland to examine efforts that could hinder the ability of Ohioans to exercise one of their fundamental constitutional rights, the right to vote. These efforts, under the guise of preventing fraud, are part of a cynical effort to impede access to the ballot. Specifically, HB 194 in Ohio repeals a number of common sense measures that assist people with voting. For eight years, I served as Secretary of State of Ohio, charged with administering elections. So I understand what goes into ensuring the fundamental, the, the fundamental right to vote. Inherent in that responsibility is ensuring that voting is accessible and free of intimidation and roadblocks. As a state, over a period of decades, Ohio legislators undertook a bipartisan, and I would underscore that word, bipartisan effort to help Ohioans get access to the polls. When I was Secretary of State, we had significant assistance and input from Republicans as we made voting laws work for huge numbers of people. We understood that civic-minded Ohioans had many priorities pulling them in many directions, so we sought to make registration accessible. Utility bills, people could register, the, the electric company uh, included voter registration forms and utility bills. McDonald's restaurants, at my request in Ohio, printed a million tray liners so people could actually fill them out to register to vote. It, um, at, at, at Bureau Motor Vehicles, people could register to vote there. This was bipartisanly, by, done bipartisanly. Uh, legis the legislature, when acting, would expand this, this right to vote, make sure this right to vote was protected, uh, generally bipartisanly. But today, rather than protecting the right to vote, we're seeing brazen attempts to undermine it. We're being told that this bill and laws like it will reduce costs and reduce the risk of voter fraud. The overwhelming evidence, however, indicates that voter fraud is virtually non-existent, and these new, new laws will make it harder and more costly for hundreds of thousands of Ohioans to exercise the right to vote and more costly for the election system, meaning taxpayers, county boards of elections, all that too. Now, Madam, Madam President, voters, voters are simply not going to wake up one morning in Cleveland and vote and then drive to Elyria and then vote and then drive to Norwalk and then vote and then drive to Medina and then vote and then drive to Mansfield and then vote. People aren't going to defraud the system that way. Why? One, they're going to get caught, probably. And second, they're going to jail if they do that, all to take the risk of perhaps giving Barack Obama or Mitt Romney five more votes in a state of 11 million people. That's just not going to happen. Yet, the people that want to go after our, that are attacking our voting rights are claiming that individuals are going to do things like that to defraud college students voting in college and then voting back in their hometown. People aren't going to do that because the disincentives are too strong. The penalties are too harsh. There's simply no reason so that you can vote one extra time that you would possibly do that. So the new, the new law, let me tell a little bit about this new law. The new law repeals, and this is what's disappointing to me, Madam President, is that this new law repeals what was a bipartisan effort in 2006. 2006, in response to some election problems of 2004 in the presidential race where people stood in long, long lines to vote, and there were other problems, 2006, the Republican House in the Republican Senate in Columbus, and the Republican governor with support from Democrats, so it was strongly, it was clearly bipartisan, passed voter reforms to set up early voting, to set up one week where voting and voter registration and early voting overlapped so people could actually register and vote or during that week in early October. Um, did other things that made voting a little bit more accessible, registration and voting more accessible. But the new law, the, in, in spite of that, the, 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 in spite of the consensus in Ohio about voting, now there's an effort to undercut that consensus. First, the law significantly reduces the early voting window. It takes away Friday, Saturday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday voting before the election when over 100,000 people voted in Ohio that year, in 2008. It was made despite the fact, this reduction in early voting was made despite the fact that evidence overwhelmingly indicates that limiting early voting will actually cost 
taxpayer boards of elections money. Make no mistake, cutting Sunday voting was intended to suppress voting. On the Sunday before the election, so Ohioans who work long hours during the week often go to the polls after church, fulfilling their civic and their spiritual obligations on the same day. By ending early voting, the lines outside polling stations on election day will only get longer, the cost will only increase. This increases frustration and limits voting. Another burden posed by HB 194 is that it bars poll workers. It bars poll workers from performing one of their most basic functions, help voters, helping voters find their right precinct. This, no law, this law no longer requires that poll workers assist a confused elderly, disabled, or young voter in getting their correct precinct. So here's how it works. As we've tried to save money, as more people have voted earlier, uh, relieving some of the pressure on election day, the boards of elections have combined voting precincts. So instead of so you'll, you'll have fewer precincts in the same county and have to hire fewer poll workers. But what that also means is sometimes they combine these precincts um, in these voting stations into one building so people might walk in uh, to a polling station and go to the wrong table. And under the law now, the poll worker is not required to help that person and say, no, you can't vote here, but you can vote across in the, in the room next door at this church or at this school. So someone will today might walk in and the poll worker will simply say, you're not eligible to vote in this precinct, and you'll walk home and not vote. So this law discourages in many ways, because these poll workers are people who live in the neighborhood, it discourages neighbors from helping neighbors. I conclude with saying that this is a solution in search of a problem. It's not something we need to do. It, in fact, is a solution in search of a problem. There was consensus in Ohio that things needed to change after 2004. The laws enacted in 2006 led to shorter lines, more clarity, and less frustration uh, for voters. While none of the changes I mentioned today make it impossible to vote, they install, they build burdens to voting, burdens that have no good reason. And that will mean fewer minority voters, fewer young voters, fewer elderly voters, fewer disabled voters. That may be what some politicians in this town want, but it's not what the Ohio, what people of Ohio want. Ohio deserves better when it comes to protecting our most fundamental constitutional rights. Madam President, uh, I suggest the absence of the court. The clerk will call the roll.
The senator from Ohio. I ask you now to suspend the quorum call. Without objection. Madam President, I ask you now to the Senate proceed to a period of morning business with senators permitted to speak. They're in for up to 10 minutes each. Without objection. Madam President, I understand there are four bills at the desk. I ask for their first reading in block. The clerk will read the titles of the, of the bill for the first time in block. H.R. 2050, an act to authorize the continued use of certain water diversions located on national forest system land and so forth and for other purposes. H.R. 2240, an act to authorize exchange of land or interest in land between Lowell National Historic Park and the City of Lowell and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and for other purposes. H.R. 4628, an act to extend student loan interest rates for the undergraduate federal direct Stafford loans. H.R. 4849, an act to direct the Secretary of the Interior to issue commercial youth authorizations to commercial stock operators and so forth and for other purposes. Madam President, I now ask for a second reading in block and I object to my own request in block. Objection having been heard. Objection having been heard. The proposals will be read on the next legislative day. Madam President, I ask unanimous consent that when the Senate completes its business today, it adjourns until Tuesday, May 8th at 10 a.m. that following the prayer and pledge, the journal of proceedings be approved to date, the morning hour be deemed expired, and the time for the two re leaders be reserved for use later in the day. That the Senate resume consideration of the motion to proceed to S-2343, the Stop Student Loan Interest Rate Hike Act, with the time until noon e evenly divided in control between the two leaders of their designees and that following the remarks of the two leaders, the majority control the first 30 minutes and the Republicans control the second 30 minutes. And that following the cloture vote on the motion to proceed to S. 2343, the Senate recess until 2.15 to allow for the weekly caucus meetings. Without objection. The first vote tomorrow, Madam President, will be at noon on the motion to invoke cloture and the motion to proceed to S. 2343, the Stop Student Loan Interest Rate Hike Act. If there's no further business to come before the Senate, I ask that it adjourn under the previous order. The Senate stands adjourned until Tuesday, May 8th at 10 a.m.